ambitious, self-indulgent, and the eldest son of Queen Victoria. He was a big person, and he liked being quite debonair. He knew exactly what to say to people. He had a reputation for being able to put people at their ease. He dragged the United Kingdom out of the Victorian era into a shiny new century and inspired the Edwardian age. He is like a great big sunburst. This was written at the heart of a very, very wealthy empire. The Edwardians enjoyed a golden era. It is a time of great privilege and luxury. But no one ever thought Edward would be a success. They had very low expectations of him as a potential king. As king-in-waiting, he was written off as a useless philanderer with a long-suffering wife. The Prince of Pleasure or Edward the Caresser. He does have lots and lots of affairs, lots of girlfriends. In this program, we reveal the full extent of his scandalous private life. He's very happy to disavow Harriet in court, and that ultimately results in her being confined for the rest of her life in a lunatic asylum. How his beautiful wife, Queen Alexandra, stood by him. She was so tolerant of his misbehaviors, and maybe that also undermined her health. And ultimately, how this playboy prince turned it all around to become one of Britain's most successful and popular monarchs who saved the royal family. The monarchy was really not fit for purpose. Edward did manage to pull it back quite quickly. He was truly the first people's king. London, the 9th of August, 1902. Coronation day for the new King Edward VII. The ceremony marks the dawn of a new century and a new era of British royalty after 64 years of Queen Victoria. Edward's coronation was a huge affair. Much was expected of it and really the eyes of the world were fixed upon London anticipating this great event. He absolutely knew as king it needed to be one of those occasions with great ceremony and drama and he made absolutely certain that he was the principal player in that story. King Edward was driven to Westminster Abbey, accompanied by his consort, Queen Alexandra, his wife of nearly 40 years. The ceremony wasn't filmed, but this fascinating footage reveals what it might have looked like. It was filmed more than a month beforehand in front of a charming painted backdrop of the Abbey it was released on Coronation Day to great public acclaim. The coronation was a spectacular triumph. It would pave the way for the Edwardian age, which would go on to last for more than a decade until the outbreak of the First World War. The Edwardians enjoyed the spoils of the British Empire in an era that would be known for its elegance in fashion and the arts and its advances in design and technology. It was all a long way away from the gloomy formality of the Victorian age. It's ceasing to be the sort of horse-drawn, slow society. It's becoming the fast transit modern society with developments in transport, telecommunications, assembly lines are coming in. So this is becoming a recognisably modern society. And for the upper classes, I think you could probably say they never had it so good. The luxurious lifestyle of the Edwardian aristocracy is perfectly demonstrated in glossy romantic dramas like Downton Abbey. Low-paid domestic staff service the needs of their lords and ladies of the manor, a tradition that continued into the reign of King Edward's son, George V. Royal historian Alistair Bruce is an expert on the Edwardian era. In Downton Abbey, you see this sense of everyone having their place, be you the king emperor at the top or the person who scrubbed the streets or lit the gas lamps. Right from the start of his reign, King Edward was keen to transform the public face of the monarchy. That included upgrading Buckingham Palace and building Admiralty Arch, transforming the Mall into a world-class ceremonial route. The royal pageants we know today the weddings, jubilees, and fly-pasts 
all have their roots in the plans of Edward VII. Going under Admiralty Arch down towards Buckingham Palace, all of that in a way was being constructed um, in this period and sort of being presented as something that had happened from time immemorial. King Edward's mother, Queen Victoria, was rarely seen in public. She had spent much of the last 40 years of her reign in mourning for her husband, Albert. Now, Edward wanted to put on a show. And this era is at the beginnings of celebrity, and he's right at the heart of this very sort of glamorous world. He goes to the theater, you know, the West End becomes this very glamorous thing. And Edward is sort of touching all these different bits because he's very much a man about town. He just never stopped eating, drinking, and smoking cigars. And I think with his top hat at its jaunty angle, he represented the very embodiment of the age that took his name. Edward VII became a hugely popular monarch, but at the start of his reign, no one took him very seriously at all. He was thought to be a prince of pleasure with little experience of state responsibilities. There were reservations among some that really, this was a hedonistic prince, but not really cut out for kingship. Nobody ever mistook him for an intellectual. He was a kind of good time boy. He could take people out. He would entertain them at banquets. He knew exactly what to say to people. There were all these sort of rumors that surrounded the new king. And Kipling, the writer, called him a, a corpulent voluptuary. He had a reputation as a playboy, as a womanizer. Henry James, the great American writer who lived in Britain, called him the arch vulgarian. The womanizing king had had several high-profile relationships outside his marriage, pushing against the accepted boundaries of the time. And one of these relationships would end in a very public and scandalous trial that had the nation gripped. Lady Morden was sectioned, effectively. She was declared mad. Her own family say, oh, she's mad, and they put her in a loony bin. Before he became king, Edward VII had a reputation as a carefree prince of pleasure with dozens of mistresses. Known to his family and friends as Bertie, his first encounters with women took place when he was just 19, at a time when Queen Victoria and Prince Albert kept the life of their son and heir under strict control. Throughout time, human beings will find their sexual expression. And that was no different for aristocrats and even princes of the royal blood. And yet for Bertie, it was difficult because he had parents who established such strong moral codes into which he was actually a prisoner. His mother, Queen Victoria, despaired of Bertie's potential as heir to the throne. He was, to her, really a massive letdown, certainly compared to his father, Albert. And Edward really turned his attention away from the schoolroom and instead lived a life of pleasure. At the age of 19, in a break from his studies at Cambridge, Bertie was sent to train with the Grenadier Guards in Ireland. The Queen thought this might knock a sense of duty into him. Bertie, in the eyes of his family, makes his first really big mistake in, in 1861. He's living at an army camp in the Curra in Ireland. A kind of sexual prank takes place in that some of his fellow officers invite this woman Nellie Clifton, the woman of easy virtue. And he goes and he finds her in his camp bed. And he's very keen on this. And I remember when I was researching this and looking at um, Bertie's diaries, there's an entry around this time at which he says, NC, first time, NC is Nellie Clifton, NC, second time, NC, third time. So there's absolutely no question that the young prince slept with Nellie Clifton. But this was something that was completely normal for a young aristocratic male to do. It was only natural that his fellow brother officers would give him the chance to discover his sexual identity too. And what human being of that generation, given that huge opportunity in relation to the prison he'd lived in, would turn it down? 
When Victoria and Albert found out, they were appalled and urged Bertie not to be tempted by women. They were also trying to arrange his marriage to Princess Alexandra of Denmark. Albert dreaded the effect of what he called Bertie's fall from grace on their wedding plans. With this incident, it was his great worry that the future King of Denmark would not allow his daughter, Princess Alexandra, to marry a broken prince. Albert needn't have worried. Bertie's engagement to Alex went ahead without difficulty. Living in different countries meant they barely got to know each other before their marriage. And they met for the first time in the Cathedral of Speer, and near Heidelberg. They got on very well. But of course, the wedding itself had to wait several years because she was young. Alex was 16 at the time, the sweet-natured oldest child of Prince Christian of Denmark. She was famously gorgeous. She was very lively. She wasn't particularly bright or well-educated, but she loved having a good time and she rode a horse beautifully. She was a lot of fun to be with. They married two years later in 1863 and were very much in love. Bertie was faithful to Alex at the start and she had no idea he had a roving eye. But he was soon meeting other women, at first out of her sight in the brothels of Paris. He does have lots and lots of affairs, lots of girlfriends. Even after he gets married, he had a tremendous reputation in Paris for visiting brothels and going to the theatre and having affairs with opera singers and actresses. In Bertie's social circle, adultery was really a sort of recognised sport. Bertie may have thought, well, you know, they're all at it. Why on earth shouldn't I? Bertie's adventures in Paris began in 1864 when he was 23, just a year after his marriage to Alex. We know that he went to a very classy brothel called Le Chabonnet. Our knowledge about this mainly comes from later years when the fixtures and fittings uh, of this very fancy brothel were sold off and, and certain, certain kind of objects become associated with Bertie. The prince is said to have used this chair to entertain two women at once. This is a kind of two-level construction. It has a kind of a platform at the top and a platform at the bottom, and it has handles. And it's quite hard, to be absolutely frank, to work out quite what you would do on this. It's believed Bertie also enjoyed the use of this silver swan-necked bathtub. Infamously, he was said to have a bathtub which he liked to fill with champagne to entertain his ladies. Bathing in champagne seems I feel like the idea is probably better than the execution. Bertie may have pulled off these escapades in France without the knowledge of his wife or his controlling mother, but he had other relationships closer to home which soon came to their attention. It's very hard to know how many mistresses Bertie had. There's hardly any letters, any correspondence from women is preserved in Bertie's papers. And this makes it very difficult to trace the exact nature of his relationships with, with all the women who were named. Bertie's favourite women came from aristocratic and celebrity backgrounds. He would meet them at society dinners, dances and even at the theatre. We know he had very much a soft spot for Wagner, but we also know that he liked a, a more kind of robustious sort of theatre, the sort of theatre in which, uh, you know, people showed their legs. A mistress, the word today, implies um, a slightly seedy relationship, perhaps, and probably an adulterous relationship. For Edward VII, I think he thought these relationships were sort of what he deserved to have as prince. One of Bertie's best-known lady friends was Lily Langtree. He met her at a dinner party in 1877 when he was 35 and she was 23. She launched her acting career off the back of her friendship with Bertie. And Lily Langtree was this married woman from Jersey whose father was a cleric. She arrived in London with her husband and very soon seemed to have charmed all of London society, including the Prince of Wales, who couldn't get enough of her. He showered her with very expensive gifts. They went to a party on board a ship 
and the captain, for a joke, um, filled the cabins with laughing gas. Um, and you can imagine that was a rather riotous occasion. When Lily wrote her memoirs, she played up her role as a royal mistress. But Bertie's surviving letters and diaries offer no evidence of a physical relationship. Really a break came between them when she put a spoonful of strawberry ice down the back of his neck uh, in public. And that was a, a, a line that she crossed and the relationship really cooled after that. Lily had affairs with other young aristocrats and gave birth to a baby daughter outside her marriage. Bertie was quick to distance himself from Lily, but his intimate relationships with other women showed no signs of slowing down. His 30-year friendship with Lady Jennifer Churchill, the mother of Winston Churchill, started because Bertie was friends with her husband, Lord Randolph. It's one of the few relationships that's quite well documented. His letters to her survive because she kept everything. And they say things like, can we meet for tea? And would it be possible for me to come to luncheon? Very often there's a lot of sort of endearments, but it doesn't mean that this was a sexual relationship. In her lifetime, Jenny Churchill was rumoured to have slept with 200 men, but there is no hard evidence that Bertie was one of them. Winston Churchill uh, is said to have asked uh, her whether she thought she might be in with the chance of becoming the first lady of the bedchamber. The once close friendship between Bertie and Lord Randolph Churchill suffered. One of the tensions in the relationship between Lord Randolph Churchill and Bertie was, of course, the fact that Bertie had this long-standing flirtatious relationship with Lord Randolph's wife. When Lord Randolph died of syphilis in 1895, Jenny sought advice in arranging his funeral. Among those she turned to was Bertie's wife, Princess Alexandra. Some of, of Bertie's mistresses were not unknown to Alexandra. They were from their mutual social circle. So Jenny Churchill did consult with Alexandra. This was about protocol, but it certainly shows this extraordinary attention at this time for preserving appearances. The minute there was, say, a court case because of a divorce, that led to, you know, serious shutdown. But if it was sort of people were discreet, they could behave in quite an immoral way. One of Bertie's female friendships did lead to a divorce case and a serious scandal. It had begun in 1867 when he started calling on Lady Harriet Mordaunt. Her sisters were friends of Bertie's. Harriet Mordaunt was a young woman who was married off to Sir Charles Mordaunt, a rich aristocrat. Harriet was 20 and 12 years younger than her husband. When he went abroad on a fishing holiday, Bertie visited her in the country and watched her riding her two new white ponies. But Sir Charles came home early and found them together. Historian Anne Somerset is one of Harriet's descendants. He flew into a terrible rage and uh, the Prince of Wales made himself scarce. Sir Charles had the ponies dragged before Harriet and, and the ponies were shot before her eyes. Worse was to come eight months later when Harriet gave birth to her daughter Violet. The premature baby made Harriet panic. The child sort of developed something slightly wrong with her eyes and Harriet leaps to the conclusion that she's infected her with venereal disease. So she calls Sir Charles to her and she tells him that the child isn't his, that she's uh, misbehaved with a number of men, in including the Prince of Wales. Once again, Sir Charles flew into a rage. He ransacked Harriet's desk and found letters from several men, including Bertie, though his were innocuous. When her husband wanted to divorce her, he called Bertie as witness. But in the end, rather than go to trial, Lady Morden was sectioned effectively. She was declared mad. Her family, her own family, say, oh, she's mad. And they put her in a loony bin rather than um, allow her to appear in court. Despite his wife's absence, Sir Charles pressed on with the trial. It led to lurid headlines in papers such as the Illustrated Police News with Bertie tagged as the royal visitor. The Prince of Wales was the star witness, 
but spent little more than five minutes in the witness box. He was questioned in a very cursory way. Um, in that court, he wasn't asked anything very detailed. He was simply asked in a way to deny the affair. He's very happy to disavow Harriet in court under oath. And, you know, that ultimately results in her being confined for the rest of her life in a lunatic asylum. No one claimed Bertie was the father of Harriet's child, but there have been suggestions of a conspiracy to silence her, something which suited several people. Her own family said she was mentally incapable and royal doctors agreed, so she never got to defend herself. There's a suggestion that, you know, Bertie was sort of colluding with Harriet's father, Sir Thomas Moncrief, to ensure that she was declared insane. And certainly, they all seem to have been prepared to, to sacrifice her, providing that the so-called honour of the family and indeed the um, status of the royal family was protected. Bertie assured his wife Alex and mother Queen Victoria that he had done nothing wrong and they believed him, while Lady Harriet was locked away for nearly 40 years until her death in 1906. In these sort of days of the Me Too movement, many people would feel more severe about him. I think, in all fairness, one should play credit to his better qualities and his achievements as king, and how he actually sort of managed to be a very popular monarch. Thirty years after the Mordant scandal, Bertie was crowned king. His relationships were so well known in society by then that they were amusing rather than scandalous. He insisted that a group of his former mistresses should be invited to the coronation. Accompanying Edward at his coronation was, of course, his queen, Alexandra of Denmark, but also a group of women, the king's mistresses, who were together in a pew that was dubbed the king's loose box. And so mistresses of long standing, Jenny Churchill, Winston Churchill's mother indeed, and Alice Keppel. So long-standing mistresses of Edward were there at the heart of this establishment occasion. One wonders slightly what the atmosphere was like within it. I mean, I think there must have been a, a sort of palpable rivalry going on. Bertie had been a playboy all his life, a trend that would continue into his reign. And the excesses extended to other areas of his lifestyle too. His drinking, eating and smoking was infamous, and soon it would bring him to the brink of death. Let's not forget that this 48-inch chest, 48-inch waist, there is a kind of foul burst that comes from it that says there's been an abscess in, in his flesh. Edward VII spent more than two-thirds of his life with Alexandra of Denmark, his wife and queen consort. At the age of 18, Alex took part in an arranged marriage with the rebellious and hedonistic Prince Edward, who had grown up starved of affection by his strict parents. I think it's quite clear that Bertie turned out the way he did because he felt neglected and unloved. At home, he had so little love in his family that he went out of his way to find affection outside. Alex tried her utmost to be the love of Bertie's life, but when he needed more than she could provide, Alex found ingenious ways to ease the heartache it caused her. There's something about the, the nature of that marriage that that in part explains uh, why he was never faithful to her, because it was one that was, in essence, imposed upon him. But it was advertised as a love match. Alex was three years younger than Bertie. He first saw her photo in 1861, when she was 16. Her father, Prince Christian, was heir to the throne of Denmark. They lived in a palace in Copenhagen. Alexandra made her own clothes as a child. She shared a bedroom with her sister into her teens. There are stories about her recycling her clothes as, as furniture covers. Can't really imagine Queen Victoria doing that. 
They were very fond of each other and they were also very active. Alexandra's father made them all do kind of, I think what you call calisthenics now. You know, they had to kind of go outside and jump and do star jumps. Bertie and Alex's wedding took place under a cloud. His father Albert had died and Queen Victoria was in mourning. She insisted the ceremony should take place in Windsor. Queen Victoria thoroughly approved of Princess Alexandra and indeed, to a certain extent, had sort of hustled Bertie into proposing to her. But she didn't want it to be forgotten that she was this grieving widow still in the throes of terrible unhappiness at having lost Albert. The newspapers were very critical of Victoria's decision. Um, Punch, for instance, uh, wrote that the wedding was going to be in an obscure Berkshire village, uh, which only had an old castle and very poor sanitary arrangements. St. George's Chapel was chosen as a private venue, convenient for the Queen, so she would not have to leave the castle or meet the public. Victoria sent word that the guests and bridal party should dress in colours of mourning. At least Alex was allowed to wear white. There's a great painting by Frith in which you see the married couple and then above there's a sort of box in the wall where the Queen stands and all the light is on the Queen. The Queen's grief also taints the wedding photographs. She insisted that a bust of Albert should join them while she sat between the married couple. Albert has to be brought into the photograph. It's like a kind of weekend at Bernie's thing, isn't it? His corpse is almost in that photograph with them. Having cast a shadow over Bertie and Alex's wedding, the Queen would exert a similar controlling grip over their marriage. Though he loved his mother and wanted to please her, Bertie struggled to find a role for himself. She tries very hard to stop them from having dinner parties and tells them they shouldn't be going out and that when Alexandra has her period, Queen Victoria wants to know about it and she shouldn't be going out then. I mean, she really tries to micromanage them. It shows Victoria's influence on her son and her daughter-in-law and she refused to kind of give him access to cabinet papers. She really didn't want him to step up and play a role. There was the thought that Edward would if he was given responsibilities, he wouldn't necessarily stick to them or he would go off partying or he'd show the papers inappropriately to other people. With no immediate royal duties to take up after their wedding, Bertie and Alex moved into Marlborough House on London's Pall Mall, a stately home less than a mile from Buckingham Palace. The young couple became the toast of high society. When Bertie and Alex sort of plunged themselves into the social world. It was very exciting. Invitations to Marlborough House were hotly coveted. The Marlborough set, uh, the people associated with them. There's a sort of frat house uh, kind of atmosphere, I think. Everybody stays up late, they play billiards, they drink quite a lot. Bertie and Alex were London's most fashionable couple and Alex soon established herself as an influencer. Society women rushed to follow her example. Alexandra had an incredibly good figure and she loved clothes and she had a natural sense of what looked good. She popularized jeweled chokers or, or multiple strings of pearls or diamonds, but actually that, that was to hide a scar on her neck, but she looked so attractive that other ladies adopted the whole fashion and that became all the rage. Alex also had a positive influence on the reputation of the royal family. She was a person who worked through persuasion rather than by aggressive argument but she found ways of getting her own way. Alex was soon boosting the royal couple's reputation around the world. When they visited Egypt and Turkey, she was paid a great honor by one of the world's most influential leaders. One of the great powers at the time was the Ottoman Empire. And of course it was Muslim at heart, and the Sultan who ruled it was one who observed all those ancient strictures of his faith. And yet, a very special opportunity was given to Alexandra to be his guest for dinner. 
Now, this was incredibly rare. It was actually unheard of. And yet, because I think she had set such a fine example, she was always so adroit in her behaviour and she was always so poised that the Sultan expressed his own affection for the United Kingdom and the power of the British Empire by giving this very single privilege. The Prince and Princess of Wales had six children, five of whom survived into adulthood. The Queen was determined to watch them all being born, but the last thing Alex wanted was her controlling mother-in-law to show up. This may be nothing more than kind of rumour and, and tradition, that Alexandra's pregnancies were only admitted late in order to kind of wrong foot Victoria, so she wasn't there waiting outside the door to impose herself um, as each new baby arrived. Alexandra had three children within the, in the first four years of her marriage. They weren't perfect pregnancies at all. I mean, her first child, Eddie, was two months premature, and her third child, Louise, was born when she herself was ill. At the time of Princess Louise's birth, Alex was so ill with rheumatoid fever that rumours of her imminent death began to circulate. The Times newspaper had to publish an official denial. The severe pain in her knees and legs meant she could only sleep with the help of opium or laudanum. Alex was also hard of hearing, and her illness made it worse. As Alex grew older, she was almost stone deaf, and she also had a limp and she was therefore very conscious in public. And she couldn't sort of participate in, you know, in, in Bertie's vigorous social life of, of dancing and parties. Alex was determined not to be overwhelmed by her health problems. Once she'd recovered and resumed her role as Bertie's rock, she found ways to create a rewarding social life that meant she could avoid his late nights out. She insists on dancing. She was a great dancer. She, she was wonderful at work, waltzing. And she always danced with what came to be known as the Alexandra Glide, which was keeping one leg straight. She developed a limp, but she limped so gracefully that other ladies actually sort of started copying her and uh, affected a slight limp themselves. Alex preferred the quiet life at Sandringham to noisy London society. She loved Bertie, despite his affairs, and grew to accept the life he led in London with other women. Bertie couldn't manage without her and always went home to his wife and family. She was looked after by Bertie and he was a devoted husband and father. It's difficult to know how accepting Alexandra was of Edward's philandering ways. And I think there is evidence to show that she came to a certain level of acceptance. And yet she was so tolerant of his misbehaviours. And maybe that also undermined her health. But together they were a great team. Queen Victoria may have supported Bertie in public, but thought his behaviour was not befitting of a future king. All his life, Bertie was a constant disappointment to his mother except in the last moment before she died. She seems pleased to see him and she speaks his name. So that, as far as we know, Bertie is the last word that Victoria spoke. And it's a kind of forgiveness, I think, perhaps, at the end. It's a sort of reconciliation. After nearly 60 years in waiting, Bertie, the Prince of Wales, was now King Edward VII. But his decades of smoking, drinking and overeating were quickly catching up with him. His doctors warned him that without urgent treatment, he might die in the middle of his coronation ceremony. There's a possibility that it's appendicitis, but once Treves cuts into the body, the, the, let's not forget this 48-inch chest, 48-inch waist, there is a kind of foul burst that comes from it that says there's been an abscess in, in his flesh. The nation, indeed the world, held their breath. In the end, the 40-minute procedure was successful. He sat up in bed, he emerged. In a way, this added to the sense of excitement and expectation. The coronation was delayed two months to allow him time to recuperate. 
King Edward VII was determined to drag Britain into the modern age, but not everyone was happy about it. Many British people who were quite restrained saw this old building that they loved turned into something like the interior of a French hotel. And that was probably quite surprising. When Edward finally became king, he was determined to modernize the monarchy. The start of his reign heralded a new era of hope, optimism, and creativity. He began by insisting the family should leave their beloved home at Marlborough House and move into the main royal residence of Buckingham Palace, which had been largely left empty by his reclusive mother. Alexandra was totally against the idea but Edward said it was essential to make the monarchy more visible. She was desperate. She didn't want to leave at all. And she put up all sorts of reasons uh, why it was impossible for her to uproot herself. And only very reluctantly um, does she agree to go. Buckingham Palace was full of junk, full of things that had just been clutter, full of, full of and everything terribly dirty. And the king wants to get rid of everything that reminds him of his parents and then um, to redecorate it uh, and to create a, a Buckingham Palace, which will be an ideal backdrop uh, for um, the ceremonial court um, that he intends to hold. Edward and Alexandra hired theatre designers and decorators to make the palace look more glamorous. Some people said that his decoration of Buckingham Palace looked a bit like the Ritz Hotel. It was all red carpets and gold leaf. But all the same, it, was, it did give the sort of theatrical appearance that he wanted to give to his monarchy. Many British people who were quite restrained saw this old building that they loved turned into something like the interior of a French hotel. And that was probably quite surprising, but it was the sort of illuminated wedding cake of this new era. And King Edward VII used Buckingham Palace and all these new ideas to be at the forefront of a new empire and a new way. It really was a case of kind of charging, recharging, rebooting um, the monarchy. And he really did hit the ground running. And it was about getting rid of the old and bringing in the new in many ways. He immediately shows that he's going to embrace a completely different style of, of kingship. You know, Queen Victoria had basically hidden herself away for decades, and she very reluctantly came out. He is like a great big sunburst, basically. He is bringing monarchy into the 20th century, and it's going to be visible, and it's going to be glorious and gilded and splendid. This ceremonial side of the monarchy was right at the top of Bertie's agenda. The opening of his first parliament in 1901 was the perfect occasion for him to create a public spectacle. This was a, a really important act uh, because it marked a, a, a real break with what had happened under Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria, uh, particularly in the last 40 years of her reign after Albert's death, uh, very rarely opened Parliament. With um, Edward, all that changes. He goes to Parliament in a marvellous coach, wonderful horses. He's wearing, you know, all his sort of robes. Alexander sitting next to him um, in mourning, but looking absolutely marvellous, as only she could do. When he gets to Parliament, um, the king reads his speech himself. And this is a very um, important sign that the monarchy is going to play this very sort of um, ceremonial position within the Constitution. So here we have him basically saying, you know, it's now different. I am going to be a very present kind of monarch. And yes, of course, he kind of cleared out um, some of the, the furnishings of Victoria, who, of course, you know, his mother, she'd been queen for decades. So, you know, there was a lot of stuff to sort out. Totally unlike his excessively private mother, Edward wanted the public to see the changes he was making. Edward VII was perhaps the first um, monarch to realise the importance of not just doing the job, but being seen to be king, to be constantly in the public view, to be constantly photographed, which was now becoming possible. So his legacy, perhaps, was his understanding of the importance of being a king who could reach out to his people, who could be seen sort of driving in his car um, through crowds of people, 
um, uh, waving and, and, and being amongst them. He was very conscious that he must show himself, be accessible to his people and uh, not hide himself away as his mother had done all too often. The king needed to be seen to be believed and Imperial Britain felt that it needed spectacle to seduce the masses, really. These great state of events which proliferate through the 20th century, you know, the big royal weddings, a lot of the big events that we associate with the majesty of monarchy are kind of reformulated at the beginning of Edward's reign. As Prince of Wales, Edward had already cultivated a reputation that was almost the polar opposite of his mother's. But as king, the traits which his mother had deplored in him, extravagance, lack of formality, became a real asset. I think there's one way in which you can really see Edward as, as, as embodying the spirit of his age, and that he is in a way a kind of anti-Victorian. That whole decade, is shaped by the desire, I think, to put the 19th century behind it. There's a kind of disgust for the Victorian that, that, that is, is very apparent in the early years of the 20th century and became even greater later. And in a sense, that whole era is rebelling against Victoria, is trying to make a break with her, just in the way that he also tried to expunge the Victoria from his life once she departed the picture. Here was something new and a chance to be breaking free of all that constraint, all that endless British expectation of good behavior. This was a new king who represented that burst of joy, burst of change, and opportunity for the aristocratic classes to have their great time in the sun. And the ebullience that had perhaps got him into trouble became the very element that made him the success he was. The king loved the new technology that was coming on stream, and he was personally involved in a major moment in international communication. When the first uh, transatlantic radio message is, is beamed by Marconi, the sender is Teddy Roosevelt, the recipient is Bertie. That's part of the story of the special relationship, the fact that this, uh, this Morse message goes across the Atlantic and goes from Roosevelt to, to, to Bertie. When he received a message from the President of the United States, it was the start of something exciting and new in the 20th century. And of course, he was the first great monarch of that century. This was also the era of the motor car, which gave individuals such freedom to roam. But this exciting invention was a status symbol that only the rich could afford. He was a great aficionado of it. He loved being driven around. I mean, they must have been terrible, smoky old things. But he was determined to represent the creative empire that he was the king for. And after all, Britain had brought the world the Industrial Revolution. And its success as a trading nation depended upon its capacity to stay at the forefront of all ingenuity and technology. And he recognized his role in that. In this era of exciting technological advancement, the Edwardians also adopted radical new styles in the way they dressed. Alex had her own very distinctive look and Edward himself was regarded worldwide as an arbiter of men's fashion. When Edward VII became king, it was a time when gentlemen of his station would change no less than seven times a day. And so dress and clothing was very much a part of the apparel of kingship. And there was a lot to cover. He was a big person and he liked being quite debonair, quite uh, ebullient in the way he chose to dress. He also set another trend which still holds today. The tradition of uh, having the lower button on a waistcoat uh, undone. Again, that was uh, Edward's invention as a product of his uh, large stomach. It's still something that you're told to do if you get married in a suit from Moss Bros. Um, and it's said that he's the founder of this tradition and it's slightly a way of disguising the fact that his belly is kind of bursting through this, this garment. For the ladies, voluminous skirts were out and the Gibson girl was in. Named after an American artist, this embodiment of the ideal Edwardian woman was slender 
with an ample bosom and hips and hair piled up on her head. It's a period of a great change in, in women's fashions. That Gibson girl look um, with, the, with the waistline going higher and the neckline going lower and all of those enormous picture hats that would have been a great annoyance to anybody in the cinema, I think, or in the theatre. The actual materials that were being used to uh, craft these fantastic ensembles were, was very much about um, creating a sense of richness. It is an era that really celebrated innovation uh, in terms of fashion, using chemical lace, using machine-made um, objects, using garments that were uh, made. It's, the, it's the, really the beginning of the fast fashion era of mass manufacture. And so there's a great sense of uh, of the new, of new designers, new in all sorts of different ways that punctuates it as a very exciting decade in fashion. Under the fun-loving king, the leisure and pleasure industries boomed. The Apollo Theatre and the London Hippodrome opened and another famous landmark, the Ritz Hotel on Piccadilly, which quickly became the ultimate high society destination. The King was a big fan and loyal client of hotelier Cesar Ritz. As these elegant vintage photographs demonstrate, the glitzy new hotel's groundbreaking features included ensuite bathrooms, double glazing, walk-in wardrobes and beds made of brass rather than wood, the definition of luxury. The Palm Court soon became the place for elegant tea dances. There's also an interesting architectural turn here that, uh, that we can call the Edwardian Baroque. You know, you've got buildings that are on the inside are extremely modern, like the Ritz Hotel, which has a kind of skyscraper structure. It's steel inside there. But the outside of it, you'd think it was, um, you know, it was something that had dropped down from the Palace of Versailles. Um, it's very ornate, it's gold leaf. Um, when you're walking inside it, it's like a kind of uh, Versailles Hall of Mirrors effect. Everyone hankered for a taste of the high society glamour of Edward's lifestyle. Even if the Ritz was a little beyond their means, they too could enjoy the sophistication of taking afternoon tea at one of the many corner houses, or maisons, that sprang up across the country, especially those belonging to the Lion's Corner House chain. Life might have been fine and dandy in Edwards Britain for those who could afford it, but there was a less golden side to the golden era, a huge divide between the haves and have-nots. It's probably too easy to sort of forget about the fact that all sorts of people were actually living in considerable hardship. And, and in fact, you know, there, there were very bad um, class tensions which were intensifying during the reign. Many thousands of men and women were in service at this time. It was a, it was a huge employer, but there's no doubt that the hours were long. It was incredibly difficult work. Often the treatment could be very poor. And so life in service really highlighted that distinction between the super rich and those people who were actually providing them with service in the country house setting. The Edwardian era is, um, it's a kind of golden age before the horrors of the First World War. It is a time of great privilege and luxury. But on the other hand, where the Edwardian era gets its sort of tension from, is that it's also a period of extreme um, inequality in income, a period of acute poverty, and a period when you see the beginning of important welfare reforms. Though life in Edwardian times changed dramatically, some things stayed the same. Edward was still seeking companionship from women who were not his wife, and one of them has a direct link to Prince Charles. Bertie had strayed throughout his marriage, and that didn't change when he was king. 
and one woman had the dubious honour of becoming known as his last mistress. Alice Keppel was famous before she started her affair with Edward because she was one of the sort of most famous society hostesses in London. Her dinner parties were a hot ticket because lots of politicians and, you know, famous aristocrats would be there. People are made to understand that if they want to have the king to dinner or if they want to have him to stay, Mrs Keppel must come too. Uh, so she constantly ha accompanies him and, and she has a, a very good effect on the king. She was able to put him in a good mood. If you wanted something out of the king, the best thing was to ask Mrs Keppel um, and she will um, get the right answer. Um, she was witty, she was um, quick, she was interested in politics. She was able to act as a kind of bridge between the king and some of the liberal leaders with whom he didn't get on very well, people like Lloyd George. Um, and um, basically, they both um, enjoyed being with each other. I don't think it was a very passionate affair, um, but it was a sort of, um, it was rather a grown-up relationship. Mrs. Keppel is very interesting because she is much younger than him and the relationship is one of companionship and friendship. Um, I don't think it is necessarily the same sort of sexually promiscuous relationship that he may have enjoyed in his youth. There's an interesting way that history repeats itself in the relationship between Bertie and Alice Keppel because, of course, two direct descendants of those people are Prince Charles and Camilla Parker Bowles. Camilla, the current Duchess of Cornwall, happens to be the great-granddaughter of Mrs Keppel. It says something about what I'm going to call a kind of class consciousness that, that goes down the generations here. These are people who are all from the same part of, of society. They all had relationships with each other. The, those lines of descent follow and all their great-great-grandchildren still all know each other. So I think it says something about a kind of continuity of, of social life and possibly a continuity of mores from the beginning of the 20th century to the end of it. Two women played a crucial part in shaping the King Bertie became. Mrs. Keppel helped him to broker his relationships with the leading politicians of the day. Meanwhile, his wife Alexandra was by his side on big state occasions, helping him wow the crowds and also throwing herself into charity work. Alexandra is strong-minded and she had a very strong sense of dress. And um, she also had a sense of theatre. The night that mourning for Queen Victoria was, was due to end, uh, there was a, a, a court ball and uh, she was repeatedly asked if uh, ladies were still expected to be in black. And she, she was very evasive. She managed not to give any sort of answer. So the lady guests took the decision to play safe and all came dressed in black. Suddenly the doors open and Alex enters looking sort of radiant, stunning, uh, all in white with diamonds, uh, and uh, sort of so she was like this sort of magnificent swan in uh, sort of bright plumage, uh, whereas all the others were like uh, sort of dowdy crows. Her lady-in-waiting described it as uh, that she was shining like a star in the night sky and it was a declaration of her prominence that she was, uh, compared to the London ladies, as she called them, she was the most prominent woman in the room. As Bertie continued being unfaithful to her, Alexandra found all manner of ways to communicate her displeasure. Alexandra was clever at managing Edward and punishing his indiscretions uh, fairly subtly. She was deeply hurt and often humiliated by Bertie and his shenanigans, especially because it was impossible to keep it private. And one of the ways in which Alex responded uh, to her husband's affairs was to take herself out of the picture almost completely. You know, she traveled to visit relatives in Denmark or Russia or traveled in the Mediterranean, making it very clear that she wanted to distance herself from her husband because she disapproved of his actions. 
and there was another surefire way to put him in his place. He's obsessed with punctuality, and she is constantly, blithely, infuriatingly late for everything. And the idea of keeping a king waiting is completely unacceptable. But Alexandra knew exactly what she was doing, um, and she would appear looking absolutely wonderful, and the king would fume, and the point would be made. But despite the friction over his affairs, the relationship between Bertie and Alex had lots of strengths. There are plenty of eyewitness accounts of, of, of great fondness, almost a sort of jollity, really, going on between them. They enjoyed each, each other's company. They were good-humoured in each other's company. I think, in a way, it, it's a surprisingly functional relationship, um, given the circumstances, and a relationship of some complexity. There doesn't seem to have been much agony in it, if I can put it like that. Aside from her mischievous attempts to punish her unfaithful husband, Alexandra threw herself into charity work. Alexandra has an extraordinary sort of innate sympathy. Um, a bit like Princess Diana, she was able to visit hospitals, to talk to everybody she could see, to shake people's hands, to cheer them up. She helped raise funds to fit out a hospital ship named the Princess of Wales that was used to bring back wounded soldiers from the Boer War. She brought a sense of responsibility and kindness to the monarchy. Queen Alexandra, in her own quiet and dignified way, was this living example of what the feminine side of monarchy could always bring, which was compassion, that sense of the charitable, and the loving nature of a state that was in its own way becoming more liberal and more aware of those who needed help. The value that Alexandra brought as queen to her relationship with Edward as king cannot be underestimated. And in some ways, she can be seen as his saving grace. But Edward's excessive eating, drinking and smoking were finally catching up with him. Every larder had been opened to him, every drinks cabinet, and a lifetime of that indulgence was bound to take its course. And his health did decline, and everyone could see it. Queen Alexandra watches this with great sadness. He had achieved so much since he came to the throne, but his reign was about to come to an abrupt end. Edward VII was the first king to foster a truly public persona. Some believe he saved the monarchy at a time when other European monarchs were soon to be toppled from their thrones. After so many years where the Queen just hadn't been visible and there really was a sort of rising tide of republicanism, it seemed that, you know, the monarchy was really not fit for purpose, it was out of touch, it had lost its way in many ways. So it was quite remarkable, really, uh, that Edward did manage to pull it back and pull it back quite quickly. Actually, he won heart and um, he did prove himself to be a, a king fit for the times. And though Edward's reputation as a fun-loving playboy never left him, his many triumphs far outweigh this. I think we remember Edward as a man overly devoted to pleasure, but there is a, a serious side to him that is neglected and, and unremembered. He's one of the brokers of the Entente Cordiale, for instance, that made relations between France and Britain a lot more friendly than they'd been in the past. So if we're going to kind of refocus him slightly, let's think less about the, uh, the cigars uh, and the horses, and maybe more about this side of him, about his, his kind of political nous. And when Edward went on an official visit to India, he also demonstrated an enlightened outlook on race relations. He was deeply shocked by the behaviour of some of the British officials out there. And he came back determined that something must be done to stop the racist behaviour um, of the English against the Indians. He writes home to his mother that all the people in India would be far more accepting of our rule if he actually treated them with firmness, but kindness, not with brutality. 
He had defied all expectations of him, particularly those of his mother, and he was determined to make sure he didn't make the same mistakes with his own children as she had with him. Edward sets about training his son up to be king. You know, he makes sure that George has a desk next to him. You know, he makes makes that part and parcel of, of, of what you do for an heir, is that you prepare them. Towards the end of 1909, Bertie's health was failing. He just won't look after himself. He goes on smoking cigars, he goes on eating huge amounts. He finds it harder and harder to walk. Um, and, you know, basically his body gives out on him. Alexandra returned from a trip abroad to find him seriously ill. And on the 6th of May, 1910, Edward suffered a series of heart attacks. But even at this difficult time, the King's mistresses were never far away. Mrs. Keppel had a letter which the King had written to her, um, telling her uh, that if ever he um, became ill or was um, on his deathbed, um, she could come um, and um, say goodbye to him. So she produced this letter, and Alexandra, on the strength of this, allows Mrs. Keppel uh, to come and say her goodbyes to the dying king. And Mrs. Keppel, when she saw him so ill, has a sort of hysterical fit, starts weeping and, and, and making a lot of noise and being very sort of what you don't want to have in a sick room. So she's bundled out of the, um, out of the room um, and um, uh, shortly afterwards, the king dies. After he dies, Alexandra has his body laid out at Buckingham Palace for eight days. His sudden death produces a sort of extraordinary, massive outpouring of public grief. The shops are all draped with black, people are in tears, and his son George makes the decision Edward VII should lie in state. And um, at Westminster Hall, um, his coffin lies, and for several days the crowds come filing past. You know, the, the queues go stretching right through the sort of streets of Westminster. Um, people wearing black, people of all classes, um, you know, a lot of poor people, not just the rich and the privileged. Predictions he would be a terrible king had been proved totally wrong. His funeral was held 11 days after his death, and it too drew huge crowds. The funeral of Edward VII is in a way, it's the biggest production number of his career. It's the climax of it all. Um, he has been the person pushing for this kind of monarchy, this highly um, ritualized, um, spectacular version of monarchy, where all its processes are attended by a sense of choreography, a sense of style too, and a sense of the people being involved as, as spectators and, and participants. When the crowds cheered him when his cortege passed down the streets of London, they were there out of love. Love for a king that in a very short period of time had managed to establish a relationship with the people that was unprecedented. He was truly the first people's king. I think he's represented the grandfather everybody wanted, and this is what royalty does. It sort of embodies that generational reality that every human being lives. And he was very much a part of a dying age. And with the death of the king, the joy and frivolity that he represented and embodied, I mean, literally embodied, was seen to be vulnerable, mortal, and gone. Edward VII is remembered as a wise king and a great sportsman. The Edwardian era, like the Victorian era, has now become a legend. In less than a decade, the Playboy Prince had managed to create an entirely fresh new era, one that is still very much remembered and loved today. A lot of people felt a great sense of regret that the reign of Edward VII was cut short. And People, some people suggested that, you know, if he'd lived 
um, possibly um, the golden era could have continued and um, possibly the First World War uh, could have been avoided. One legacy of his reign was the fact that the monarchy in Britain survived as it did throughout the 20th century, you know, particularly the First World War, when so many other um, kings fell from their thrones. Edward VII did succeed in reforming and modernising the monarchy, and perhaps more than that, um, uh, making the monarchy a, a, a sort of central uh, to people's sense of being British. He showed how he could play a difficult situation in lots of ways with, you know, the rising tide of political and social reform and the pressures in Europe. He actually played those to his strength and was seen to be a measured, peacemaking, constitutional monarch, actually exactly what was needed at the time. After less than 10 years on the throne, Edward VII created an impressive legacy. And what of the era that was named after him? When people look back at that time, there is, with, at one level, a great deal of nostalgia for a, you know, a lost age of long, lazy afternoons hunting on the rivers and evenings spent in, you know, going to the theatres or the music halls in, in London. He reigned during a remarkable period of flux, and it's left us with romantic impressions of high society living and a touch of bygone luxury that we all secretly long for.